Imagine having access to the hidden wisdom of the richest and wisest king in history and get him to decode and redefine the way you go about wealth, success, and prosperity. So today we're going to be unlocking King Solomon's writings here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 of the Wealth and Wisdom series here on the Seven Figure Squad. Okay, let's dive right into it. So my first key lesson from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, decoded, is that bad mistakes can undermine a very good reputation, product, brand, or service. Let's read here what he has to say in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. It reads like this. As dead flies give perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. So this lesson, this little smidge, a bad smell that people may experience with your product, your brand, your service, or more importantly, your reputation, can bring a lot of negative distractions, unnecessary negative distractions your way in your pursuit of wealth, health, prosperity, and building generational wealth. So this is a very key lesson, again, for aspiring millionaires and current millionaires who want to go from millionaire to decamillionaire, millionaire, decamillionaire to hectamillionaire, is because one small smidge of a bad reputation, one bad experience, one legitimate experience of a bad reputation or a bad experience with you can set investors back, can set potential customers back, can set back potential partners with you back because of what you've done in previous endeavors that may say, hey, you know what, let me take a pump on the brakes with this guy or let me take a bump on the brakes with this particular investment. So however you go about building your business, just make sure you have a solid reputation. Very easy thing to build a solid reputation. Be very careful of what you say yes to and often say no. It's been my experience because listen, I'm a guy that I love people. I love helping people out and sometimes I get trapped up. Also say, yes, I'll do this and yes, I'll do that. And early in my career, instead of saying the word yes, I will often say, said, yeah, I'll do that or I'll do that. Next thing you know, I'm stretched thin. And oftentimes we go through our masterminds at our office and we ask people, what do you want? How are you gonna get there? Let's start expanding your network. Let's talk to friends and family and expand through your friends and family and your potential uh, investors, potential clients who may have done business with you in the past that know of you, of your reputation from your previous job, from your, peer, uh, your previous uh, investment that you had with them, or just you going about, you living life. Do you have credibility? And oftentimes people have a hard time expanding their business because they burned bridges in the past, or they haven't come through with the word, or they've been stretched thin, or many often times they said yes to a lot of things and never came through and they kind of blew them off and either they owe people money. For example, there's this comedian named Gary Owen and Gary Owen goes on his podcast and says, don't you hate it when people that you've helped out in the past, they see you know they blow up and they completely forget about you and they forget the investment of time and energy and money you made into them. They see you know he's calling out this guy who's got this website called Humor Mill. This guy that runs the website I loaned him $4,100. He came to me dang near crying, tears in his eyes, because he was about to get evicted from his home. So we came up with an agreement that I'll give him $4,100. And I already know when you give somebody money, you probably ain't getting it back. I'm not stupid. What we did was he said, Yo, I, he, he has websites and he does stuff like that. He goes, I'll build you a website, dude. He goes, and he goes, I'll build you a website and I'll build you like a fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 website and that'll be my payment back to you. I said, cool, that's that's a good deal for me. I was looking for somebody for a new website anyways. Never built a website, didn't do nothing. I said, just pay me back, man, at this point. So he never paid me back. And then he said, he's been depositing money into my account at one point. And I said, I never got it. And I said, well, send me the bank statement. He said, well, we just moved. We can't find a bank statement. I was like, so he never sent it. And then at one point I went to Twitter and I said, yo, humor mill mag, you ever plan on paying me back? And he called me threatening me. He was like, Gary, I know you tried to holler at one of my uh, workers one time and da da da. It just sucker. Shit. It's funny when you needed the money, you was cool and you was very humble. And when you got the money, you didn't build a website. Now you're cocky. Now you don't want me to burn your name. He's going, they're going back and forth. And this guy drops a comment on Gary Owens Instagram page. So listen, man, if you only knew the whole story, blah, 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 blah. Listen, it's a simple conversation. That small smidge of reputation has people think twice about investing in a company doing business with you. Because if it's a $4,100 problem, how come he just doesn't call up Gary Owen and say, hey brother, I appreciate you helping me out. Thanks for providing me the seed capital to start my business. Thanks for getting me my start. And here's my repayment of the investment you made in me or the money or a loan I borrowed from however they arranged it at the time. 
So therefore he doesn't have to worry about Gary Owen calling him out a comedian, has a massive platform. Now everybody knows, a guy that, that this is none of my business, but how am I doing? Because I follow Gary Owen because I love comedy. I love watching comics. So that's an example of having a smidge of a negative reputation. You might have a great product, brand, or service, but that smidge of a reputation puts flies over something that actually, actually smells pretty good. So that smidge of reputation is what King Solomon's tried to explain why dead flies make even perfume smell bad. My second key lesson here from Ecclesiastes chapter 10, decoded, is that the right approach matters. How many times have you often heard people say, hey, listen, man, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Let's read what King Solomon says here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse two and three. The heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool goes to the left. Even as fools walk along the road, they lack sense and show everybody how stupid they are. If a ruler's anger rises against you, do not leave your post. Calmness can lay great offenses to rest. I believe a lot of the problems in America today, in the world today, can be solved by some of the lessons here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I can't go too much into it. I'll encourage you to do that and come back to the comment section here and say, hey Matt, I, I read in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse eight and nine or seven and 10. There's nuggets here that's too much for this video to do, but I wanna encourage you to do it, to not rely on me to read all in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 for you because I don't wanna be the one responsible for reading your Bible. You read your Bible. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher in the church. I'm not a deacon. I'm just a lay person in the church as an entrepreneur looking at from a lens, looking at the scripture, looking at what God wants to do in my life from the lens of an entrepreneur wanting to properly steward the blessings, the gifts, the talents, the money that he's bestowed my way. But if you look at here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and understanding not what it is to do, but how you go about doing it, it's understanding how wise people go about doing business. And here's how wise people go about doing business. They go about doing business for the long term, not the short term. Recently, I just turned 50 years old. And as I look back in my 20s and 30s, and now lately the 40s, my hastiness for success was in my 20s. Instead of surrounding myself with wise people, instead of surrounding myself with people that have been there, done that, I just bought manuals, I bought courses. I figured these things out on my own. Matter of fact, there's one of my courses right here uh, I bought for like 5,000, 10,000 bucks, right? But one of these courses, thinking that I can do this by myself, instead I can not only combine that course, but combine it with the person teaching the course if I just upgraded myself to a particular fee. But an investment, that investment accelerate me going by because this course, I'm learning this stuff for the very first time. These guys have been doing over and over and over and over. And by the way, before you buy anybody's course, ask them for proof of concept. Who are your students? Who are some happy customers? Are there some happy people that have been part of your mastermind? Happy people that have been part of your course? Because I see a lot of people selling courses online that have never actually experienced the thing that they're teaching in that course. Or they write a book, but they've never actually done what they've wrote about in that book. It's all theory to them, which is a big danger of how people get caught up just buying information. Because if you buy information and add it with masterminding and add it with actually coaching, those put, two put together, you'll find it real quick whether that person coaching you or masterminding together with you or leading that course, it actually has experience and wisdom behind it outside of being smart enough to put these things in a course or manual that you can easily purchase for X amount of dollars. So it's not to say what to do or what to obtain, but how to go about executing the things that you learn. My third key lesson here from Ecclesiastes chapter 10 is the power of effective leadership. Let's read what it says here in verses 16 and 17 of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. It reads like this. Woe to the land whose king was a servant and whose princes feast in the morning. But blessed is land whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. It's interesting here how King Solomon writes in 16. If you understand here, it gave me the insight here that those that didn't work that day were foolish if they ate in the morning. So how many times have you heard from some people that your, your best meal is breakfast? I've heard, now this is, you gotta unpack this for me, and for those of you a lot more smarter and wiser than me, please put it in the comment section, but when was the actual meal of breakfast introduced? Because according to scripture here, I don't think that breakfast or any meal was eaten until you got up that day, you actually got some work done, and it's something to show for, for that day. Because it even says here, that woe to the land whose king was a servant and wasn't a leader. He was a servant there to please people. It's like a child 
running the kingdom. They're there to please people instead of being a leader and ruling. Why? Because the people, our own laziness, our own human nature says, I want to eat now. I want my pleasures now. I don't want to have to earn anything. But what does it say in chapter 17? But blessed is the land whose king is of noble birth and whose princes eat at a proper time. Meaning that I would think that proper time would be after some effective work got done that day or leadership or some things were delegated throughout the day. The people look back at the day and say, you know what? Today's a good day. I have something to show for. We advanced the kingdom today. And by the way, how many conveniences do we have to be able to eat just to eat? They eat for strength and not for drunkenness, not for gluttony. And I think if you read those things, that's a big solve. It's a big feature here of this Ecclesiastes here of what King Solomon wrote here to solve a lot of issues that sometimes we have an overindulgence of things as human beings. It also reads here in verse 18, it goes like this, because through laziness, the rafters sag because of idle hands, the house leaks. Now, if you look at the rafters, right? They're sagging because they're not tightened up. They're not, they're not sealed up. And because nobody's taking care of the house, everybody's just kicking back, relaxing, eating, getting up apparently here's a scripture in King Solomon, people getting drunk, leaks. Why? Because it's sagging, sagging water. The water weighs down the cloth, and so therefore the, the house and the rafters leak. Why? Because people are idle and not working. Think about how strong and powerful this message is today of don't do any work, blame everybody else, let the government provide this for you, let other people provide this for you, you just kick back, relax. Think about how powerful that message and blame everybody else. Is everybody else is part of your problem? King Solomon here said, no, man, leadership is, or the lack thereof leadership, that's the problem in America today. If you want to become an aspiring millionaire, if you want to be a millionaire to go from a million dollars a year to $10 million a year to hundred, become a hectare millionaire, you cannot be idle. You got to use effective leadership. And most important effective leadership, in my opinion, is leadership by example. I can never ask somebody to do something I myself are unwilling to do. So part of effective leadership here, even Brian Tracy said in one of his books, that everything rises and falls on leadership. And before I wrap, let me leave you with one last thought. Oftentimes people think that money is evil. That money is one of these things that you should not pursue. Let me help you dispel and demystify some of the thought process. Let's go back to 1 Timothy. It says that money and the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself, but the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, if you now go to the Old Testament, here to Ecclesiastes, written by the richest and wisest king who ever lived, King Solomon. He writes here in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 19, it goes like this. Check this out. A feast is made for laughter. Wine makes life merry. And money is the answer for everything. Money is the answer for everything. Of course, some of you guys say, well, no, God is the answer for everything. Absolutely. One time I heard a pastor one time say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. The practicality is that money is necessary and required to advance either a for-profit organization or non-profit organization. I mean, look at what uh, Sam Altman is of OpenAI. Did you hear about the, the craziness of, between him going back and forth between OpenAI and Microsoft, and Microsoft back to OpenAI? He's a 38-year-old CEO. He started a non-profit with OpenAI in 2015, got it funded, even Elon Musk was part of this whole thing. They made it a for-profit in 2019. A lot of things that weren't happening. He didn't have a board seat. Financially speaking, he wasn't retained. They didn't take care of him. They didn't give him stock ownership. Nothing. Some craziness was happening over there at OpenAI. The board decided to kick him out. I think the uh, one of the board seat members was the guy that founded Quora, the question and answer website, Quora. Anyway, make a long story short, because of the lack of communication between Sam Altman and the board, they kicked him out. So OpenAI, Microsoft said, we'd love to have you over here. We put 14, 15 billions of dollars of our money into OpenAI. We'd love to have you over here. So he goes over there. But here's a problem too as well. Back to effective leadership. Money may have sounded great over there at Microsoft. But guess what? Money was defaulted into a leadership responsibility. Because Sam Altman went back to OpenAI. Why? Because at 770 employees, 702 said, if Sam Altman don't come back as our CEO and the leader of this company, we're out of here. We're leaving. What did Open IA say? Boom. Let's keep these guys back. We got to do whatever we got to do to make Sam Altman happy. Bring him back. Make our employees happy. Why? Because AI is just taken off. You know, chat GPT. Everything is taken off with artificial intelligence. And we need to be a leader of the technology. And we need the right people. Which also goes to tell you that you don't build a company. You build people 
and the people build a company. And effective leadership and money answers a lot of things and decodes a lot of things when going about as an aspiring millionaire or millionaire getting to the next level in your life. So if you're intrigued with what we have to share here at the Wealth and Wisdom Series and how it can apply to your life and how you go about pursuing wealth, wisdom, prosperity, and happiness, please make sure you follow the other episodes we have here on the Wealth and Wisdom Series as we unpack the hidden secrets and decode what King Solomon here has to say in not only Proverbs, but also Ecclesiastes. We've got a couple more chapters to go here in Ecclesiastes, so make sure you stay tuned here every Sunday at 6 p.m. We unpack this with you here on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. That being said, please drop your thoughts, your comments, your feedback. You agree with me, you don't agree with me, please put it in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe and hit like and share with those going about with faith and finance as their priority. Appreciate you guys tuning in. From Dallas, Texas, I'm your money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.